Just after the age of the dinosaurs, and before the modern solid state era, came the short lived but glorious period of the valve state or tube amplifier. In really simple terms, a tube has a heating element that heats a cathode and other parts really hot so that high voltage electrons want to fly into the vacuum of the tube. The electrons actually come from the negative terminal, which is called the cathode and are accelerated towards a plate, also called the anode, which is connected to a positive high voltage as much as 360 volts DC. In between the cathode and anode is what's called a grid. Tiny variations in the grid voltage have a big effect on the number of electrons, i.e. the current reaching the plate, or anode. Hence, the term valve amplifier. The power tube also uses an extra part called the screen to pull more electrons to the plate, thus creating more current. The high voltage signal is then sent through an output transformer which removes any DC component and has a high enough impedance to act as a suitable load for the signal while stepping down the voltage for output and increasing the current so that the signal can finally be safely sent to a speaker for our ears to enjoy. Arguably, because everybody likes to argue these days, the most famous of all instrument tube amplifiers, at least during the classic era of rock and roll, is the Fender Champ, which some have hailed as the most recorded amplifier in history. The Champ, and its close brother, the Princeton, which simply adds a tone control knob, are based on the very simple 5F1 and 5F2 circuits respectively. 5F1 is a very minimal circuit with one 12AX7 preamp tube, one 6V6 amplifier tube, and a 5Y3 rectifier tube for the power supply. The small number of components makes for a simple and easy to understand signal path, and they also contribute to what many consider to be a purity of sound which defines the ultimate vintage electric guitar tone that we're all used to hearing in countless classic songs. When you're ready for music to hit you in the face and stab you in your heart, there's nothing like good old fashioned tube amplifiers. Unfortunately, tube amplifiers were largely relegated to the history pages for one really good reason. They are expensive. The amount of copper and iron that go into a decent high voltage transformer and output transformer can add up to more than 10 pounds Another inconvenient truth is that much of the character of the sound comes from the way the tube circuit interacts with the inductive load of the output transformer as well as the voltage sag from a power supply being pushed to its limits, which affects transient attacks that also greatly color the sound. A year ago, I purchased a 5F2 amplifier kit and put it together. I instantly fell in love with the sound and it made me feel like I was 16 years old again with my first guitar. Original vintage Tweed 1960s amplifiers typically go for $2,000 or more, and even modern vintage reproductions will set you back around $1,000. Much of the expense of a tube amp is related to unavoidable items such as transformers and tubes, but much of it is also due to vintage aesthetics which are irrelevant for the sound. Of course, in the interest of full disclosure, when considering a DIY project, I have to admit that the little extra expenses for this or that can quickly escalate the DIY budget to nearly the same cost as commercially manufactured unit prices. But you get so much more satisfaction as well as the ability to customize features to your own taste. So building your own amplifier is greatly satisfying. Having built one amplifier, from someone else's kit, I couldn't help wondering if I could come up with something better. The first thing I did was research all the common modifications for 5F1 and its close cousin, the 5E3 amplifier. Rob Robinette has created some excellent pages that explain in detail how tube amplifiers work. A link to his page will be provided below. The resources on his site were invaluable to helping me with my project 
and I highly suggest them for anyone interested in DIY tube instrument amplifiers. In short, the 5F1 circuit starts with a 1 mega ohm impedance resistor that acts as a load for the guitar pickup output. In a somewhat frightening fashion, only a 68K resistor separates the guitar signal from the preamp tube grid. This is affectionately known as a grid stopper and it stops any current that the grid might accidentally pick up from the electrons which are flying around it and keeps them from going back to the guitarist. The preamp stage is coupled by a capacitor which blocks the DC plate voltage while allowing our AC audio signal to pass through to the second preamp stage where a potentiometer is used as a voltage divider to regulate the signal volume before being amplified by the second triode of the 12AX7. Once again, another coupling capacitor blocks DC while allowing the signal to finally reach the power tube grid. With the help of high voltage applied to the screen, the power tube amplifies the signal and passes it through the output transformer. A little bit of the output signal is also taken from the output transformer in such a way that it is 180 degrees out of phase with the signal at the second preamp stage's cathode and mixed back in. This is called negative feedback. While this may seem counterintuitive, negative feedback helps flatten frequency response and compresses the signal for a cleaner sound. Notice I didn't say a clean sound. These amplifiers are designed for very high gain operation, not high fidelity sound reproduction. There are many choices out there nowadays, but I've been using Eagle CAD for laying out circuits for a long time, so I sat down and started with copying the 5F1 circuit. This is very similar to what Leo Fender once did, as the 5F1 bears a strong resemblance to circuits featured in the once ubiquitous RCA tube designer's handbook. The basic versions of Eagle limit PCB size, so I knew that I had to split the circuit up into two halves. The obvious choice was to create one PCB for the power supply and another for the amplifier circuit. This also has the advantage of separating the AC circuitry, which generates electromagnetic hum, from the sensitive amplifier elements. The original fiberboard used in the vintage amplifiers is also susceptible to moisture and inferior to modern PCBs for electrical insulation, especially when we're talking about voltages from 300 to as much as 700 volts DC. With careful layout and routing, I was also able to keep nearly all signal traces on one side of the PCB while leaving the other side as a ground plane for even better noise rejection. Many vintage builders try to stick to original carbon composition resistors, which besides being hard to find and expensive, are also known to be noisy and inferior to modern metal oxide resistors, unless you really like a little white noise with your music. Some people also use wire wound resistors, which are cheap and have great power handling, but the little wire winding is basically an inductor coil, which creates a variable resistance depending on the frequency being passed. And while those frequencies are generally way past 20 kilohertz, I don't feel wire wound resistors are acceptable for this kind of amplifier application. Vintage builders also like to stick to classic orange drop capacitors. These are physically large and also extract a premium from your wallet. For ease of a compact through hole PCB, I selected other quality film capacitors which have little effect on the sound. I decided to incorporate a few of the most popular modifications to the 5F1 circuit which significantly increased its usefulness while being true to the minimalist spirit of the circuit. First of all was to add a master volume control to allow preamp distortion without high volume. Secondly was the negative feedback control. Negative feedback is a weird counterintuitive thing kind of like EGR, exhaust gas recycling in cars, that helps clean up the sound a bit. The 5E3 Tweed Deluxe doesn't have any negative feedback and it has a really chunky raw distortion that reminds me of the Rolling Stones sound. Changing negative feedback 
is a great way of taming the beast for a cleaner sound, or opening up the pipes and letting it rip. Lastly, much of the so-called Marshall tone difference is due to the value of the preamp cathode bypass capacitor. So, I added the ability to toggle between two different capacitors for something that resembles a fat, bright switch. Vintage builders will often tout the purity of special point-to-point -point hand wired amplifiers which use component leads as much as possible to make connections rather than wire on a fiber or turret board. I think that a compact PCB layout offers equal or shorter physical signal path as well as better durability and ease of assembly, but I don't expect to make any converts from the P2P purists. So now let's take a close look at the power supply board. We start with the standard EIC connector so that our cool amplifier doesn't have several feet of power cord sticking out that it has to be managed somehow at all times while we're moving it around. Next we have a convenient cartridge fuse holder. I still love a panel mounted power switch so there are convenient solder points for power switch leads as well as the power transformer input and output connections. The 5Y3, true to its description, is literally a current rectifier used to create DC voltage from the power transformer's high voltage AC output. Modern silicon diodes can also be used for this purpose and have less voltage drop. Those looking to save a few bucks and have a slightly punchier amp the output transformer will still limit the output though, um, may opt to use diodes instead of the rectifier tube. One really confusing thing about the classic tube power supply circuit is the five AC taps from the power transformer. These are used to act as a filament supply for the rectifier tube itself, so those connections aren't needed if using diodes. All the high voltage capacitors here, along with the resistors, create filters and voltage dividers to provide different DC voltages to parts of the amplifier circuit. By convention, these are known as B+, which is broken down into B1, B2, and B3. Convenient solder pads are available for each of the B+, supplies. Important note. These capacitors can store deadly high voltage DC for extended periods of time, so one must always be careful when working around them. It is best to have something like a big 1 to 5K resistor that can be used to jump across the capacitor terminals to safely short them out before doing any work on the circuit. Now let's look at the amplifier board. The preamp and power tube sockets are mounted on the ground plane side of the PCB. Again, this helps isolate these crucial components from the electrical fields of the rest of the circuit. It does mean that standoffs are needed to mount the PCB to the chassis. While the tube sockets typically have mounting holes, I don't see a way of using them. Maybe clip nuts could be utilized in this orientation but the PCB standoffs seem perfectly sound while inserting and removing tubes. A couple jumpers are needed to supply filament power to the tubes. Ideally, these jumpers should be placed on the ground plane side to minimize low voltage AC hum. If your power transformer has a center tap for the filament supplies, which you've connected to ground, then you can skip the 100 ohm resistors which create a virtual center tap to avoid any DC offset of the filament supply. The filament supply is also traditionally used for the panel power indicator light, so connections are provided for this. If a master volume is not going to be used, then a solderable jumper is provided to allow the signal to continue without connecting a master volume pot. When searching for a suitable chassis for my first prototype, I eventually settled on a full-size chassis, approximately 16 by 6 by 2 inches. Although it was much bigger than required 
with my compact boards. After a bit of measuring, I realized that I could fit two complete amplifiers on the chassis, especially if I could use a single larger power supply transformer instead of two separate power transformers. But before going there, I still needed to install one complete amplifier to test the prototype. One of the items on my guitar wish list for a long time had been a two or three channel rig with dry wet signals for an amazing huge sound and this seemed like the ideal way to get there. Make a special amp that could be used for two channel operation or as wet left and right channels and a separate amp for a center dry channel. After building my boards, much to my amazement, everything worked the first time I powered it up. I was careful to use a variable AC transformer to slowly ramp up the AC supply voltage to 120 volts AC over a period of about one hour to carefully condition the high voltage electrolytic capacitors. This helps extend their useful lifetime. Now that the prototype single channel amplifier design was validated, I needed to find a transformer that was as close to the CHAMP 5F1 voltage specifications as possible, but with twice the current so it could handle two separate power amps. The CHAMP power transformer output specs are about 300 volts DC at 75 milliamps. I didn't think it was a great idea to try and power two separate rectifier tubes off of the 5 volt AC transformer taps, but I knew that many amplifiers have a single 5Y3 providing power for several preamp and power tubes, so I knew I could get away with using only one rectifier tube. To still keep things as independent as possible, I decided to simply connect the main B plus transformer output to a second power supply PCB B plus input where a second set of capacitors and resistors would create a separate power supply for the second amplifier channel. Of course, the second power supply PCB didn't need to be populated with an EIC connector or fuse holder, so I skipped those components. When laying out the chassis, it was hard to fit all of the control knobs, especially when adding the bypass capacitor selector switch. I put the potentiometers on one inch centers, which is about as close as you can mount full sized pots. Keeping them as close as possible minimized wiring and helped keep the knobs away from the power supply end of the chassis as much as possible. I had to use small knobs so that they would fit with the tight spacing. And I chose different colors to help distinguish tone, volume, and feedback controls. I enlarged the power transformer cutout to accommodate the final power transformer I selected. I believe it is from a Blues Junior and is rated 325 volts DC at 150 milliamps, which is close enough to use without any other circuit modifications. Now that the electronics were done, it's time to mount the chassis in a respectable cabinet. I could have settled for some nice simple select pine, but I got carried away and drove across the county to get a piece of 1x8 walnut. With an actual width of 7.25 inches, it was just enough to provide a protective depth in the front for all of the knobs. Having already made a box joint jig for making speaker cabinets, it was a simple matter to route box joints for the cabinet top and sides. The bottom was a little bit more complicated. The chassis had 5 8 inch flanges and I wanted those to end up being hidden. The solution was to effectively mortise the bottom of each side piece to accommodate the flanges. This was actually done with a trim router adjusted to 5 8 depth and carefully leaving the front and back face of each side piece untouched. So the result was that a bottom board equal in length to the top is held in place on each side by two countersunk screws from underneath which pass through holes in the metal flanges and firmly connect with the cabinet sides. I used a round over bit to give a nice radius to the exposed edges for a clean simple look. 
prior to gluing up the top and side box joints, I routed one eighth channel on the inner faces to accommodate a screen. Much to my surprise, I was able to pick up a one by two foot piece of nice decorative stamped screen powder coated at my local big box hardware store, which was perfect to cover both the front and back tube areas. Careful measuring, cutting, and tweaking of the ends of the screen created perfectly fitting panels that don't rattle. The walnut was finished with a few coats of true oil till it had a nice gloss on it and then that was waxed and polished. Tall rubber feet were added to the bottom so that it will easily straddle the dog bone handle on my speaker cabinet and a nice lower profile handle was added to the top with careful attention to place it over the center of gravity so that the unit is nicely balanced when you pick it up. The final result is a nice compact head that feels surprisingly light when you pick it up but is also quite solid and it looks great and fits nicely on top of a 1x12 speaker cabinet.